The first time I heard that song was in 1973, and it was on the original cast recording album of Godspell, and that was on one of those vinyl albums about this big. <laughs> so it was 40 years ago, if you're doing the math. I was 21 years old and searching for something in my life. And the second time I heard the song was 1988, and that was during the first wave of the pandemic of HIV AIDS. And at 36 years old, I was already surviving my friends, and once again I found myself searching, searching for something. So the next time I heard that song was was this the one you just heard, the version, and that was only a few weeks ago. And so at age 60, I was looking for inspiration for the night of our, our event and found myself once again in a place searching, searching for something in some way to talk about the history of HIV AIDS and AIDS Interfaith Network at this time. Each decade of my life has presented me a time when I've been searching. I think that happens to all of us, searching for something that I can't always define and can't necessarily always express. But in the words of this song, Beautiful City, found the expression that I was searching for right now. And it's a message about the world we want to create the world that we can create if we choose to do it. Some decades ago, through his concept of servant leadership, Robert Greenleaf taught us about making a better world. And he said, this is my thesis, caring for persons, the more able and the less able, serving each other is the rock upon which a good society <coughs> is built. If a better society is to be built, one that is more just and more loving, one that provides greater opportunity for its people, then the most open course is to raise the capacity to serve. And at AIDS Interfaith Network, we have the opportunity to test that thesis, to practice creating a better society, the opportunity to raise the capacity to serve every day. Sometimes we are the teachers, and sometimes we are the ones who are taught. Sometimes I'm the one who is taught. So let me share one of those times with you. As we were coming into Thanksgiving last November, as we do every year. We were, we were trying to make it fun and celebratory, celebratory for our clients in the D.A.R.E. Center. And during the days leading into Thanksgiving, the staff and clients all get together and they decorate the place and participate in a lot of special activities and make food. And Chef Didi and a cadre of volunteers are get in sort of full-on cooking preparation mode and supporters have donated special uh, special th items and special baked things and treats. And everyone kind of, we try to get everyone into the spirit of it and make that spirit catching so that everyone gets pulled into it. Well, for me, it was, it was different at Thanksgiving because, as some of you know, my mother, the woman who had taught me so much about love and justice, had just passed away in late October. So Thanksgiving was being a whole different thing for me. It was hard. I wanted to feel thankful, and I wanted to feel that spirit that I could feel, see going on all around me. And, um, but inside, I really wasn't sure how I was going to get through it. But then one day, I encountered two of our clients having meals in the D.A.R.E. Center. And both of them are homeless, only able to stay in a shelter periodically, and, and I hurt for them. And yet they both asked me, what are your plans for Thanksgiving? Well, the question caught me very off guard. And in my head, I was contemplating 
how is it that I can answer this unexpected question? And I was thinking and pondering the fact that these two people may not even have anywhere to be on Thanksgiving. And how can I talk about my plans or plans for anything that, that I'm going to want to do on Thanksgiving, given that? But before I could even answer it, one of them said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give thanks for being able to come to the DARE Center. I'm going to give thanks for the people that I've met there and thanks for the food that I receive and give thanks for you for keeping this center open because I know how hard it is to fund it for, so that people like me can be here. It really kind of took my breath. <laughs> And it was a spiritual, one of those tender moments. And you know, sometimes because of what we have going on in our own head or hearts, sometimes we miss or we risk missing, risk missing what's right in front of us. His words touched me and, and taught me. And although this person was displaced and uprooted, he not only gave thanks for what he receives at AIDS Interfaith, but also gave me a gift of gratitude. And through his words, he helped me remember that gratitude has nothing to do with what we have or do not have, or with what we may have lost. But gratitude has everything to do with our connections with one another, because those connections are stronger than anything to do with having property or, or possessions. Gratitude turns what we have in any moment in our lives into enough, a meal into a feast, and a stranger into a friend. Gratitude helps us to have peace with our thoughts and circumstances today and to create a vision for tomorrow. I had been so caught up in my own feelings and needs that I almost missed the fact that despite their own needs, these people served me, helped me in that moment. And Greenleaf's words right then made sense to me. The more able and the less able, serving each other, helping each other, being connected with each other. And that's the world that we want to create. Now, out of, out of respect for their humanity, I never expect our clients to say thank you to me or any of us. We are there as staff and volunteers to serve them and to help them and to respond to their needs and to be there for them. But when it happened, this client's gratitude reminded me that the help that we give, it makes a real difference in the lives of real people. And a lot of you are part of that. So I hope this story will help you, help remind you, and help you remember too. And I offer this lesson and give these words in gratitude for you and on behalf of the client for whom it is our privilege to serve. And who, when we can allow it and hear it, teach us about the world we want to create. We can't fix everyone and everything that's broken in the world. I know that. I, I understand that. But when you and I care and give support, we make real the possibility of change for tomorrow. The world we want to create is the world where we serve one another as we realize that everyone has dignity and value and worth, and all of us contribute to each other. The world we want to create is the world where race and gender and sexuality and age, religion or socioeconomic status or level of education do not make any of us somehow more vulnerable to contracting HIV. The world we want to create is the world where we stop the stigmatization of HIV and AIDS which will then ensure that people are not afraid to be tested, not afraid to disclose their status, 
where information is the norm, where treatment is readily available, and the end of HIV infection is in sight. Amen. Amen. The world we want to create is the world where you and I don't see ourselves as any different or somehow different from a person who is living with HIV and AIDS. That's the beautiful city that the psalm talks about, the one that we would be able to create if we allow. And one line from the song early on said, can you see a ray of hope? We'll see it in you and me. We don't have to keep searching for those are the seeds of hope that are planted in each of us this day. You know, Robert Greenleaf, my mom, and the clients in this story all come from very different worlds. But somehow, they envision the same world. And you and I can create this more just and more loving world, more loving society, when we cultivate and grow the seeds of hope from within us. I know it may sound naive, but hope changes things. And no matter what age, what decades of any of our lives, it is people with hope who ultimately change the world. I have said these things to you why I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom God will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. So as we hear today's gospel, peace I leave with you. Could you use some more peace in your life? Amen. Amen. All of us could. So how about if we make some more room for peace? How about if we let go of a little fear? Because when you talk about peace, you also have to talk about fear. You might think that if you talk about peace, you talk about war. But really, if I want to talk about peace... I need to also talk about fear. True or true? Peace, in this passage, it's told to us, you know, peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. And then it says, don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So the message from Jesus is for us to notice that connection between fear and peace. See, most of us think about peace simply as the absence of conflict, right? but it is so much more. It's more than just my personal internal tranquility, even though I might want to say thank you, Jesus, for that. It's more than that. It's a larger picture. It comes from God, and it is a God-sized envision. It's a God-sized picture, an intention for the world. Shalom. For the world, this peace, this at-oneness with each other and at-oneness with God, it's a far more encompassing notion of wholeness and well-being than simply an absence of conflict. This is about transforming our entire way of being, our words, our beliefs, our actions, our relationships, our institutions, all of it, nobody and nothing. Not a thing is excluded from God's intention for shalom, for peace on the earth and in our bond with the divine. This gift, Jesus says, it's a divine bequest, a, a divine gift because we can't do it by ourselves, amen? It is gift of God. And it's so in contrast to the systems and structures we try to create with one another that often lead to the conflict and disharmony and incongruity. But the peace that God gives is a peace that passes our understanding. It is something we have to work on in relationship with God because we cannot do it on our own. We find ourselves tasting 
this peace of heaven and experiencing it, experiencing God's peace when we practice rejecting values or schemes or arrangements or institutions that harm communal well-being. When we start paying attention, not just to what's good for me, but what is also good for my neighbor, what is loving for my neighbor, I start to see the possibility of peace. Have you seen it? A few of you are, mm -hmm. have you? Can you say, a, yes, I have a, you know, yes, I've seen it. Do you want more of that? Yes. So we want to seek that which we've already tasted and find more. Walter Brueggemann, a, a theologian who I admire, said in his book, Peace, the emergence of shalom, wholeness for church, people, and earth requires some radical changes of values, presuppositions, and perceptions. Shalom only happens for communities engaged in empowering vulnerability. Ooh. In other words, you have to take some risks. Jesus, he says, knew the things that make for shalom. He calls us friends and shares with us the makings of shalom, and that's fine for the beloved community. But for the world, we'll work hard to eliminate this very message about shalom that is our ministry and calling. So from the beginning, it's been clear. A church that cares about shalom can expect to be in conflict with a world still hoping that another way is possible. Do you see the picture? If I am working for peace, I should expect a little conflict to come along with it. Doesn't that just make your head kind of spin a little bit? Because if you think that peace is the absence of conflict, then if conflict's showing up, you think you're not about peace. But if there's resistance to God's peace because people are hanging on to personal power, personal privilege, are you hearing me? That will create conflict with those who seek to create a just world. And so we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. And we pray thy dominion come or thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. But Reverend Elder Mona West this week said, really another way of translating that and understanding it is we pray thy shalom come. Because the realm of God, the dominion of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, however you want to translate that word, is about the power of God, and the power of God is about peace. God's intention for us, thy shalom come. We forget to pray for it, don't we? Sometimes we just accept that the world is filled with conflict, and we forget that it is God's gift for us to be different with one another. We forget the angel pronouncements that are throughout Scripture, do not fear. We forget God's voice through the voice of the prophet saying, do not fear, do not be afraid. And we start to remember collectively and individually that fear keeps us from peace. There's an old African proverb that says, if you fear something, you give it power over you. How many of you have known that in your own life? You start to be afraid of something, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger in your mind. And you do not have peace about the situation. You're busy praying for God to take the thing away. I just, just take it away. <laughs> We're not praying for God to show us how to deal with it. Just take it away. True? And the fear gets larger and larger. Uh, Mio says this. Fear usually originates for something in the future, not something in the present. Absorb that for a moment. Fear usually originates for something in the future, not something in the present. We're always afraid of something that has not happened yet. Once it happens, we deal with it. We're no longer afraid. We just plunge into it and deal with it to the best of our capacity. Most of the things we fear might happen, never do. If we can stay in the present, we can prevent many fears from arising. 
Granted, the mind tends to roam into the future and the past a lot. So even if you're focused on the present moment 50% of the time, you have chased away 50% of your fears. Can I get an amen? Well, that wasn't a very enthusiastic amen. If I'm always worried about what's going to happen, I'm going to be in this state of fear, yes? But if I can stay focused in the present, fully present to the moment, at least 50% of those fears have been knocked out of commission. Amen? I happened to watch Men in Black 3 last night. A little relaxation. Have some of you seen it? I think the character's name was uh, Griff. Was that the, that character's name with the funny hat? I can't kind of remember. But uh, as I was reviewing my sermon this morning, I thought, oh, yeah, that kind of fits in. Because there's this character in Men, of, Men in Black 3 who uh, sees the future all the time. And he's constantly saying, this is my favorite moment, unless this is the moment that th this happens. Or, but it could be the moment that this happens. Wait, no, it's the, mo it's the moment that this... He is constantly looking into the future, and it causes him to hardly be present. That character represents my mind and yours often. Yes? How can we have the peace of God when we're barely present? We may be afraid of answers to questions we have. Pastor Stephen talked today about HIV, and for so many years, and today as well, there are many people fearful of being tested for HIV because they're fearful of what the, the answer might be, the test result might be. Even though in today's world, we have access to all kinds of medications where people can live well with an HIV diagnosis. But still, people are so fearful of the diagnosis. They live in that fear and then denial. And what happens if you have a disease, whether it is HIV or cancer, and you know it or have it here in your head, but you refuse to go get the test? What happens when you act in denial? What happens, people? You get sick. We live into the thing we feared. True? Once having the test and getting the results, even of something we feared, we're then able to enter into a course of treatment and address the disease. And we meet the fear head on and we move through it rather than being paralyzed by the fear. Do you hear me? I can't get to the peace that passes understanding if I empower the fear. The Roman uh, the philosopher Seneca said, there are more things to alarm us than to harm us. And we suffer more in apprehension than reality. Peace comes from our countering fear, and moving through that which would keep us from moving forward. You know, it doesn't keep us from danger, but it keeps us from the fear overwhelming us. And it is able to usher us into a greater sense of peace. I think it's also about trusting God. Oh, there's a notion. <laughs> How often we pray for God to do something and then we immediately resort back to our fear and worry and anxiety that it's going to turn out another way, right? Which is meaning we might as well have not prayed because we're not trusting that God was paying any attention. We're not trusting that God intends to do something different. We are stuck in the place of fear. Yes? What if I prayed and asked God to be with me in the thing I'm worried about or to address that thing I'm worried about. And then I trusted that God was actually going to do that. Wouldn't I start to have more peace right now in the present? And wouldn't it empower my prayer to trust God even more? Fear silences our prayers. Because we think we're in charge. <laughs> But when I trust the presence and the power of the divine, who wants to give us peace, I begin to be empowered to put fear aside. 
We have some difficulty remembering that. So today, I've prepared a little handout for you to take with you, to take home for those days when you slip into fear. I thank Reverend Dr. Darrell Watkins, who had a number of these quotes, and I've added some more to it as well. So there's three pages for you here of scripture and quotes from people from all walks of life, all traditions, to remind us about putting fear aside. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will fear no evil. I'll not be afraid. I will trust. It's a psalm you know so well. My eyes are fixed on you, God. In you I take refuge. Go ahead and hand them out from the Psalms. Luke, do not be afraid. I bring you good, no good news of great joy, right? Japanese proverb, fear is only as deep as the mind allows. Nona Brooks, faith in God supplants all fear. We've seen evidence of people facing fears recently in lots of walks of life, but this past week we saw an NBA player, Jason Collins, who came out of the closet. He faced the fear that he could be rejected as a professional basketball player. Didn't it take courage? Don't you know that there's times when he worried and wondered? But he came out. And now that fear does not overwhelm him. And he has peace at truth-telling. Amen? Peace at truth-telling. Helen Zagat, and this quote is in your handout. In deep quietness, I find the peace of the Spirit indwelling. I let go of all memories of hurts, sorrows, or difficulties. I have to say that part again. Because some of us hang on to those memories, don't we? I let go of all memories of hurts, sorrows, or difficulties. I know that the reality for me is the promise. Lo, I am with you always. I do not have to struggle with fears when I trust that God is with me. Paul in Philippians 4 wrote, do not be anxious about anything. Oh, could we hear that one? We probably need that one on our, our mirrors for every morning, don't we? Do not be anxious about anything. I'm here. <laughs> Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, let your request be known to God. And then, it says, and then. So don't be anxious. Let your prayers be known. And then, the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds. Do you see the process? You want more peace? Let go of your fears and worries, and trust the words that Jesus said, the advocate, goodness gracious, someone who's going to work on our behalf, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom God will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. I choose peace. Amen.